introductory video because it is our last road show of February. So uh, we hope that you were able to attend other ones earlier this month, but if not, and you're interested in that content, be in touch with us and we will get you access to it. And also just FYI, we will be recording this session as part of our roadshow series. You can feel free to keep your cameras on, but please mute your mic unless you're asking a question at the end during our Q&A session. I am super excited to introduce you to our speaker today. Dr. Sharon Thompson is a practicing physician and educator. Her personal and professional mission is to help women of all ages realize their personal power. She is a clinical assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Arizona School of Medicine in Phoenix, as well as an adjunct professor as Ariz at Arizona State and Grand Canyon Universities. She is also the medical director of the Arizona Family Health Partnership, which administers funds for family planning and preventative care services here in Arizona. So as you can see, she is crazy busy and highly energetic, and we think you will love her presentation today. A little bit more background, Dr. Thompson studied biology at Vassar College, and she also went on to a master's in public health from the University of California at Berkeley. She went to the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City and completed her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the Harvard-affiliated Integrated Brigham and Women's and Massachusetts General Hospitals Residency Program. In her spare time, Dr. Thompson is a voracious reader, but she also makes time for karaoke conversations about theoretical physics, of course, and trying new restaurants. Dr. Thompson, you can take it away. All right, welcome everybody. Um, let me do a little Zoom jujitsu. I'm going to share my screen with you so I can share my slides. And you'll see me twice in your little boxes because I'm going to share my slides on one screen, or I'll attempt to do so, and look at all of you on another one because you look great, by the way, for three o'clock in the afternoon. So let me go ahead and get my screen shared here. Thank you. And of course, me and my cat do everything on Zoom together. He likes to be involved in everything. So you'll probably see him <laughs> in between things. All right, welcome. I so appreciate all of you joining us on this afternoon. This is the post lunch time of day, so it's extra special that you joined us today. The first slide I have up um, is really the heart of the matter that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and that is that biological facts are not matters of controversy. And the current fight for reproductive rights is one about biological facts, and it's not winnable. And some of you may be saying, wait, where is she going with this? You'll see. But I want to talk about that, and I want to talk about shifting our conversation. So that is the heart of what we're going to get at today. But before we get there, some of you uh, already had the opportunity to put your favorite song in the chat. If you haven't, go ahead and get typing and do that. If I don't teach you anything today, you're going to have a great list that you can follow up on of songs, books, magazines to follow up on, et cetera. And it'll keep us active, awake, and alert. If you're feeling a little tired, you can feel free to stand up at any time. Just make sure your camera's off or you're wearing pants. <laughs> All right, just for disclosure, I am the uh, medical director of the Arizona Family Health Partnership, and I have no conflicts, and everything that uh, I say today are my opinions only. They are not the opinions or views of the Arizona Family Health Partnership. And everybody is seeing my slides, right? Yeah? We can see we can here first slide. presenter mode. Uh-huh. I'm sorry, are you seeing just the first one or are you seeing the disclosure slide? The first slide. Um, huh. in I can't college. figure out why that is happening. Yeah, so all the slides are showing. Hold on, on one way. second. Okay. See, I knew that my Zoom jujitsu might not be working. <laughs> all right, huh. I can always share them. I think I have it open on this. I, of course, Christina, I modified my slides since you last saw them. Uh. <laughs> Hang on, I don't even think I have them open in this other account. Well, let's try it from this one. 
you know, our Zoom skills are always improving, right? <laughs> I have no good. idea why you're not seeing the slides advance. Let's see. Can someone tell me what you guys are seeing now? Are you still seeing the first slide? We aren't seeing any slides right now. All right. No, me... can't see the other slides. All right, let me try to share again. And let's see what happens here. What are you seeing now? The disclosure slide. <laughs> Cross fingers. Good luck. Let's see if this is going to work now. All right. You're seeing the disclosure slide. And did it advance? I don't think it did. I'm you not sure why that's happening. You click present. All right. Let me try one more thing. I'm going to give this one more shot. I'm going to stop share here. Sorry, you guys. I'm going to pull the pre I, because of the two screens. Things may be weird. I don't know why, but a good woman always has a plan B, right? Mm -hmm. Hang on. I my PowerPoint needs to open. Give me one second. Oh, if I was smart. I would have had it open before. Still have people arriving. Open. So computer. And I stop share there. All right. Let's open it here. Hang on. Just, as you arrive, we're having a smidge of a technical difficulty. So give me one sec. We're going to resolve this. We are going to get this resolved. Um, let's go to slideshow. And okay, now I'm going to share my screen on this one. Oh, come on, Zoom. All right, you're seeing the first slide again? All right, yes. let's see if this works now. Did that advance? Yes, yes. perfect. Ah, <laughs> see, we always find a solution. Women work it out. All right, let's go for it. So we were talking about disclosures. All of these are my own and we'll pick up from here. If you're just joining, you've missed nothing. All right, so this is our topic for today, women and controversial moral issues. And what I really want to get at is uh, I feel that we're at a point where we need to start reframing how we approach reproductive rights. And if you've ever had a conversation with me, you know that I always ask uh, the, what everyone assumes are the basics. Um, I, I would be looking at this title saying, what do you mean by women? Who are women? How do you define that? What is controversial? And what are moral issues? How do you define moral? My morals might be different from yours. And sure enough, this presentation is going to go exactly like that. We're going to take each word at a time and we're going to um, talk about each one and what they mean and what I think that means for reproductive rights. So hang on to your seats. You can follow me. It's, it's a little bit slippery, but you can go with me, I, I promise. So before I talk about uh, the first thing, I want to remind us of last year. I think you saw in the video, uh, Bree mentioned that last year, the Arizona Family Health Partnership brought up many of us on this call together, but many women from around the state and the country to start to plan out a roadmap for women's reproductive health. And at that conference, I gave a presentation where I talked about this word women at that time. And I laid out 10 true and amazing things about women. So if you weren't there, I'm giving you a little recap because these things and, and this definition of women really forms the foundation of what we're gonna talk about today. So just to briefly run through them, women create human life in their bodies. Women are responsible for creating and birthing all the people on the planet. And this morning when I checked, there were about 7,898,000 and the clock just keeps counting. If you have a minute and nothing to do, go check out that world population clock. It's interesting to see how it keeps going. Women just keep making more people. Women can make food in their bodies. They have bodies that have built in connections to the cycles of the universe and cycles of life. Women have moods and phases that remind them of their connections with others. Women can, they're fully capable of making war and violence, but they usually do not. Women have an organ that's solely there for her pleasure without any other purpose. On average, women tend to live longer, even though women face diseases like breast and ovarian cancer that only afflict women or primarily, and they 
face death for men, which is a major cause of death for women, but nonetheless, they live longer. A woman who's had children retains pieces of DNA from those children in her blood. I don't know if you knew that fun fact. So if you're looking at a woman who's had a child, she's actually more than one person. And finally, women are capable of shape shifting. They shift from a non-pregnant physiology to pregnant, which is completely different. All the organs work differently to non-pregnant again. And they do that for the most part in health. So I want you to hold on to these things because this forms a foundation of where we're going next. Let me catch up in my notes to what we are talking about. All right. So in terms of agenda, uh, we'll paint the context and those facts that I was just talking about as part of that context. We'll come back to those facts of biology, talk about a little bit, what is controversial, what is moral? Where do we want to see ourselves at the end of this roadmap? What's there for us? And then the point of shifting the conversation. So I created a short video that I want to share with you to set the context for where we are in terms of working for women's reproductive rights. So I'm going to cross my fingers that this will play as it should. Should there be sound, Dr. Johnson? There should. Aye, aye, aye. It's okay yeah. without it. Now there was a soundtrack to go with that, but the, the, you get the point with just the headlines. I apologize every time I played it, the sound played. But the, the key thing about those headlines is that some of them are from 2009. Some of them are 2013. And if we went back to 1989 and 1999, I think you would agree that we would see headlines just like these that represent where we are in terms of women's reproductive rights or work on women's reproductive rights. The particular headline may change depending on the administration in the White House or the, the constitution of the Supreme Court, but we keep doing this flip-flop between expanding rights and contracting rights. Um, and I think, I want you to keep in mind this last headline, women must be trusted with women's reproductive rights. I want that to be reeling through your mind as we go through the remainder of the slides. So this next one, I wanna hear from you. We're gonna put up a poll right now and I want you to participate. And basically it's a very simple poll. There are three statements and I want you to state whether you feel each one is true or false. You should be able to, to participate in this poll. There are about 52 of us on the call. So just go ahead and plug your answers in. The poll is up, so. The poll is up and you should be able, it should be active on your screen. So yeah. you should be able to participate on that poll. Is anyone having trouble? A lot of trues. Okay, good. At the end of the poll, we'll put up the, the results so you can see them. Actually, if you can hold the results for a minute, we're gonna come, okay. up, come to those in a second. So Christina, you can tell me when we're, it looks like we're close to everyone who's on the call. We're a bit more than half, about 68% of All right, I'll, I'll give you another few minutes. So the growth, development, and death of new cells is part of the biology of the human body, true or false. Creation, release, and destruction of sperm daily is part of male biology, true or false. And new life beginning, growing, and ending in the body is part of female biology, true or false. And these are not trick questions, by the way. <laughs> there is no hidden agenda here, just true or false. So don't worry right. about that. Right about 80% right. of people have voted now. Okay. So we'll take that down and we'll, we'll put up the results in a minute. Is that okay, Christina? Yeah. Let me know. All right. Oh. I can't advance anymore. Hmm. 
Okay, let me try it now. Hmm. Oh, Zoom. Sorry, you guys. I'm going to stop and restart sharing because I don't know why it's not letting me advance. You know, Zoom is full of new tricks. When I was practicing, none of these things happened. <laughs> stop. <laughs> and now let's try it again. All right, let's see. All right, so you see the screen with the questions again. All right, so um, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about controversial moral issues, and this is one of Zoom's new tricks. I wanted us to be able to write on a whiteboard together, but I want you to think in your own place where you are right now at your own desk about a controversial moral issues. What comes to mind when you hear that term? And I thought this cartoon was really funny. I don't know how many of you in your households have the, the controversial issue of how to put the toilet paper on the roll. <laughs> I think that that creates more fights in households. But it, seriously, more seriously, what comes up for you when you hear that term? And I want you to be thinking about that because we're gonna come back to this issue about what makes something controversial and what is appropriate to be a controversial moral issue for us all to be talking about and what isn't. All right, so if we can put up the results of the poll, we'll share those with everyone. And we may have to do that funny stop and start share. Right, so well over 90% of us uh, agree that these statements are true. And in fact, these are just statements of biology. I didn't um, try to make them tough or, or, um, or have a hidden message. These are just truisms about the way our bodies work. Um, you can go ahead and take those, uh, the answer down, Christina, thank you. Um, so in our bodies, every day we are growing and creating and destroying cells where our red blood cells turn over every 123 days. In fact, the scientists will tell us that the you who's sitting here today is not the same you of seven years ago because the vast majority of your cells that are here now were not here seven years ago. This is just human biology. I think we all know uh, either from sex ed or having learned it as an adult that men on a daily basis make sperm and if they don't use them, their bodies recycle them, they break them down, they get rid of them and then the next day they make more. Again, simple biology. And I will assert to you today that as simple as those two facts is the third one, that new life beginning, growing and ending within the female body is part of her biology. It's just biology, it is not uh, controversy, it is, oh, we have to do it again. Um, sorry, I have to stop and start again because Zoom new tricks. Okay, let's see if this will let me advance now. Uh, hang on, sorry, you guys. Oh, I know what I need to do. New share is what I need to do. Aha, uh -huh. I figured it out. So to come back to that slide that I gave you at the beginning, uh, that I said was the heart of what we will be talking about, biological facts, the fact that women's bodies make a uh, new life, uh, that new life is created and destroyed in a woman's body is a matter of biology, right? And, and um, we need to shift our perspective. So even, some of you may be saying to yourselves, oh wait, Dr. Thompson, we know that. That's why we do this work, because we know that this is women's biology. But I wanna take us a step before that. Because the fact that we're having um, controversy and we're having debates and we're having fights about this means that there's a previous question that we already lost, right? We lost the, the, the uh, neutral ground of having women's reproductive biology disappear into the background. And, and I'll show you in a second what I mean by that. So women's reproductive biology is not a right it is not a choice, it is not a controversial issue, and it is definitely not something you need to trust women with. It is simply a fact. So when we see headlines like, we need to trust women with reproductive rights, what does that mean? Does that mean that if, I don't, if I'm not a responsible citizen, then I shouldn't have these rights? Does it mean that only responsible women, only women who are gonna make good choices deserve these rights? And certainly not, no one means that. So why is that what we're fighting about? Why is Women's reproductive biology, a matter of trust. And I'm saying to you, it shouldn't be. This is not the, the conversation that we should be having, but it's the one we've been forced into. How do we shift this conversation? 
So I'm going to show you a little bit of what the questions might be if, in fact, women's reproductive health was just biology and was not, in fact, the debate or controversy. So if we take biology as biology and not controversy, there still are moral questions, right? What does my particular religion say about my use of contraception? That depends on my religion, my values, my culture, and that may well be a moral question. It may even be a moral question that we want to argue about in public -ish spaces, like my church, or like my synagogue, or my school, or my community, but it's a moral question about me and my religion. It's not about women per se. Should boys and men be held more responsible for contraception and heterosexual relationships? They don't get pregnant, but they cause pregnancy. So how, how should the society hold them responsibly for that? Definitely a question that you would answer based on your particular values, your particular culture, and so on, the rest of the questions that I have here. And then if we take biology as just biology, right? then the state does have a role, but it has a very different role. Is there coercion or force in creating or terminating life? Are there some people forcing other people to become pregnant or to end pregnancies or to stay pregnant when they don't want to? Similar to the way that the state is involved in labor, right? Are people being forced to labor when they don't want to? Are they being paid adequately? Are, the state has a role in regulating the exchange of value around biology, but it shouldn't really be regulating biology. And in fact, I would argue that as long as the state is trying to regulate biology, we will be in an eternal war going back and forth between these pendulums as we have been. And so again, to further make this point, if women's reproductive health is not a legal or political controversy, then it fades into the background like these other issues. These are all health issues, and they're on the list because religions and cultures have something to say about each and every one of them. However, we don't see these issues swinging along this pendulum where we see women's reproductive rights. And I'm arguing you, to you today because we recognize these issues as biology. We recognize that we don't have controversies around biology. We don't have debates, uh, and, and by that I mean public policy or legal debates about biology. We have guidelines, we have regulations, we have ethical precepts, right? There's ethics around organ donation that guide who gets an organ, who doesn't. Can you pay money to get an organ, right? There's lots of ethics around that issue, but it's not in the moral, uh, in the, I'm sorry, legal or political um, uh, debate because we recognize it as biology. Same goes for blood transfusions. We know that religions have a lot to say about that. But again, whether you get a blood transfusion or not does not depend on who's in office. It doesn't matter who's on the Supreme Court because as a culture, as a country, we have recognized that these things are just facts of biology. And I'm arguing that women's reproductive health should fade into that same background. And that is really what's at the end of our roadmap that women's reproductive biology does not become legally protected by a constitutional, um, um, uh, what do I wanna say, uh, by the findings of a constitutional case, a uh, Supreme Court case, but that it stays into the background so it doesn't become the subject of a Supreme Court case. And if it shows up there, it would be kicked back as just being biology. We don't have, um, our legal arguments about things that are simply biology. And that's where I wanna see us end up. That's where I wanna see us at the end of the roadmap. I'm paraphrasing from Shirley Chisholm here to say, it is not female egotism to say that the future may very well be ours to determine. It is a fact. I talked about those 10 true things about women earlier. And one of them is that women make all the people even though only half the world is women, well, slightly more than half, even though even fewer of those people make other people, I've not made a person, but certainly women make all the people. And so if children are in fact the future, women create the future, literally. And so how do we get from here to there? This slide is busy, there's a lot on it. And I'm gonna leave it up for a minute so that you can read them, I'm not gonna read them all, because this is what I want us to discuss, right? 
how do we get from here to there? I'm not going to go into how we got here because Lord knows many, many generations before us um, went through a lot to get us to this place that we are. But I think we standing on their shoulders, it's time for us to shift the conversation so that we have women's reproductive biology shift into that background of simple biology, the things that we don't argue about legislatively or politically, and then we start fighting for what we really want. I have a couple of slides on that too that we can get into, but I want your questions. So get in the chat. I want you to ask questions about these. I want you to ask questions about everything else I said, because I really want us to have a conversation for the rest of this. I'll clarify anything. We'll talk more about what these points are about and I'll, I'll expound more on each of them. But I wanna bring you into the conversation at this point. That way we'll have a lot of time to share. So let, let me go in the chat or Christina, if you wanna pull something that someone has asked or said, we'll start there. Otherwise you can unmute and ask a question if you have one. We'll start yeah, there. I did say that I love the quote you have on the slide before. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Christina. What did you say? Oh, I said I did say that I love the quote you had on the slide before. Is that Shirley Chisholm? Um, she was full of good ones, wasn't she? That's an amazing yeah. woman. I do want to let people know if the poll is still in your way, you're able to X out of that. Um, you don't have to keep that up. But yeah, feel free to write any questions you have for Dr. Thompson in the chat. I'm going between my two screens here. Hi, Dr. Thompson. Um, quick question. Are you going to expand? I'm just curious on number five uh, for the, the different things that you have listed there. Yes. So great. And that's, this is what I want you guys. I want to talk to you. So let's talk about number five. One of the things I don't know if any of you have observed about our culture is that when men are interested in something, anything, they immediately put money behind it, right? And, and a good example of that is, I don't know how many of you heard, I think it was maybe three years ago now, that this kid, I, and a literal kid, less than 18, maybe 17 or 18, won $3 million for playing a video game. For playing a video game. So somewhere, there was a video game championship. I mean, in order for him to win, there had to have been other people. And so I, I think that we can learn from that in terms of how we support the things that we're interested in. In that, in, in no matter what it is, because I think video games are fun to play, but as a thing that you would spend $3 million on, I think it's completely asinine and ignorant. But, but there are enough men in the world who like, and women too, probably, presumably, who like video games and value them, that they were able to amass a prize of $3 million. And I think we need to, to not dismiss anything that we're interesting in, interested in, I'm sorry, as too silly to invest in, or as too minimal to invest in, or as too small to invest in. We have to start investing in our interests and using our economic power for the things that we find important. Because I am certain that many, if not most of the men who participated in that video game championship, and by, by participate, I mean funding it, I'm sure they had wives, I'm sure they had kids, I'm sure they had college tuition paid. But they want, that was important to them, so they took some of their capital and put it toward that because that was an interest of theirs. Um, they had other, other competing interests for their capital, but this was important. And I think we can learn a lot from that. Same for sports, I mean, Sports is a multi-billion dollar industry and most sports women can't participate in, or even if they do, they don't make the kinds of money that men make. And that is men saying that what we are interested in is important enough to have billions of dollars behind it. We need to start doing the same in terms of things we're interested in. And of course, eating competitions or other things. Now, I have to say in the interest of full disclosure that the things on this list are things that I find uh, not that important, right? But other people may, other people may, and I allow for that. But, but you get the larger point that we have to make money and spend it on ourselves and our interests. We have to, even with competing uh, um, activities or competing priorities for our dollars, 
to invest in, in the things that are important to us. Other questions? Other ones? Um, I'm gonna pick another one to talk about. So let's talk about number eight a little bit. So ask for what we want. I am. I, I don't know how many of you have actually read the Roe v. Wade decision, but if you read it, you may be horrified because it may not contain what you think it contains. So, and for those of you who may not know, Roe v. Wade was the decision that made it legal across the entire United States for women to obtain an abortion. And we often think that Roe v. Wade made abortion legal. In fact, that, is, that might be a bit of an overstatement. Roe v. Wade removed criminal penalties for abortion. Roe v. Wade, um, that decision uh, said that doctors uh, had the right to practice medicine um, without uh, criminal penalty. And that practice of medicine, including talking to their patients about abortion, right? Roe v. Wade is not a uh, peon to female empowerment. And in fact, if you look for women's reproductive rights in Roe v. Wade, you don't find them. Roe v. Wade talks a lot about privacy. It talks about equal protection under law. It talks a lot about sex, right? But it doesn't talk about women's reproductive biology. So I recommend you go read it. Because I think when you do, you'll realize that, gosh, I want more. I, I expect more as a woman from society than I get in this decision. Also, when you read the ERA, and I meant to memorize what it said, but it says something like, uh, there will be no discrimination on the basis of sex, right? And I find, to my mind, uh, that is inadequate because we have uh, the 14th Amendment, which says we have equal protection of the laws and there's no discrimination on the basis of sex, but somehow we still wind up with this, you know, uh, pendulum of women's reproductive rights. Because I think that we need explicit mention of women's reproductive biology. And many of you may agree or disagree, but I think that, that unless we have that explicit mention of women's reproductive biology, we will continue to have a society that expects us to be, to, that, that will give us, I should say, equal rights where we are like men and then legislate our reproductive biology separately, which is what we have now, right? If, you're, if you um, are arrested, you have the right to have your Miranda rights read to you, just like a man does. In, in being arrested, you're like a man. But if you are arrested and pregnant, your rights are separate from a man because your reproductive parts are legislated separately from the rights that you have when you're like a man. So I think that we should look at what is it that we really want and make sure that that is what's at the end of our roadmap. Also universal uh, contraception coverage and legal abortion. That's great. I mean, I think we all want those things, but is that enough, right? Is that enough? So I, when I talk about getting from where we are now to that place at the end of our roadmap, I want us to be clear eyed about what we want to find at the end of that roadmap. Dr. Thompson, oh. mm -hmm. comments in the chat. Um, one is the discussion regarding money towards our interest brings to mind the pink tax as well. Yes, yes, and that is one place, and you will see a lot of women get criticized or people will say, oh my God, why should we subsidize this? But again, and somewhere in here I talk about, maybe it's on another slide, that if in fact, the economy depends on workers and women make all the workers, then the work of making workers should have value in a capital, or I should say does have value in a capitalist society. And in capitalism, we pay for value. Yet, we live in a society that penalizes women for the part of their biology that allows them to make the workers. I said a lot in that sentence. But you follow me on that, right? And I think the pink tax is one of those things where women are saying, wait a minute, we do all this work for the, for the society. The society is built on the work that we're doing and yet we only get the cost of that work and we get none of the, the value that comes from that work. And I think that's a perfect example of that. Thank you, whoever made that comment. Thank you for that. Thank you, Karen. 
I also have how to discuss reproductive rights with women who believe that their primary function or role is strictly as a mother. So, and this is the part of that, the shift that I wanted to make. From talking about uh, female, by, the, the, the conversation we're having now in society at large, not today, is about women's reproductive rights as if we're talking about choices, as if we're talking about um, uh, a, a lifestyle, right? When in fact, what we actually are talking about is biology. A woman cannot help that she has a biology that life begins there. That is being a woman. Women are people on this planet. Their biology should not be up for uh, um, what I want debate, right? So for example, 60 years ago, we used to talk about being gay as if it was a choice, as if it was a lifestyle, right? And we did all sorts of things to gay people and we kept them from living full lives and we kept them out of so many spaces because what was the rhetoric? You have a choice, right? Fast forward low these 60 years and what have we realized? That we were wrong, right? Being gay, being trans, being bisexual is not a matter of choice. It is a matter of biology. And as we did that transformation from seeing people who were gay or trans or uh, they're still not darn trans yet. We got a long way to go. We're a hot mess. But, but as we move from seeing that as a, as a matter of choice to a matter of biology, look at the shifts that we made, right? We stopped legislating a whole lot of things. One was gay sex, right? We stopped legislating that quite a while ago because we realized, wait a minute, it is inappropriate and absurd for the courts to be deciding on matters of biology. They didn't put it this way, but in fact, that was the consequence. That once you decide that something is biology, it stops being a matter of debate. So whether a woman thinks that her role is to only make babies, that's her business. That's the way she wants to use her biology. Another woman does not want to, but what we don't do is argue about it in the law. I don't know if that helps answer the question, but, but to reframe the conversation from one where women's reproductive rights are a matter of a choice, or I don't even like the term reproductive rights, right? Because no one has to give you the ability to make a, a new life in your body. No one has to give you the ability to end a new life. I, I hate to be the bearer of this news, but lots of pregnancies end in abortion without a woman doing a thing. We have other words for that. We have euphemisms. We have miscarriage, spontaneous abortion, right? But though the, the, the destruction of life inside a woman's body is a matter of her biology. And where that becomes a matter of public policy and everyone recognizes it, that it's biology, when you get these heartbeat bills, right? Those almost always die because it smacks people right up against that what we're talking about here is biology. It's not a choice. And I argue to you that a woman who needs to terminate a pregnancy at 18 weeks, this is still just a matter of biology. What she needs from a physician is no different than if she needed um, her tubes tied or if she needed, or if a man needed a vasectomy or if someone needed an organ transplant. These are matters of biology. And I think we, we need to learn how to shift our conversation from this rights conversation, from a choice conversation to biology. And that's not gonna happen overnight, don't get me wrong. I don't think for a minute that we're gonna make this transformation overnight. But if those of us who are doing this work keep in mind that we want women's biology to fade into the background, like the biology of so many other things has, that that's our goal. That's the end of the roadmap. I hope that answered the question a little bit. Other questions or comments? Dr. Thompson, I have a question. If you were looking at um, the next decade, the next 10 years as we are mm -hmm. with the project, what do you see are the standout um, things that are low enough hanging fruit that we might be able to make change over the next decade? And what do you see on the opposite yeah. really is just starting? 
That's a great question. And it's a question I was asking myself as I thought about presenting this topic. And I would say number four is where I, I think we will have the most success. We are a country of laws. And at the end of the day, we wind up back with any dispute at the law. And if we want to change the tenor of how we talk about reproductive rights, the law is where we're going to get a big bang for our buck. And by so when I say we need the the need for women in law, meaning literal women's bodies, women's perspectives in spaces where laws are made or discussed, we need we need that. We need much more of that. And then for women to start understanding that we are absent. And by women, I mean women with their full reproductive capacity, right? All the, the periods and the ovaries and the eggs and the pregnancies and miscarriages, et cetera, that we need to put that into the law. That when we say we are protect, we are, are giving people equal protection of the law, that we have explicitly included in those protections are people with female reproductive biology. Right. If we can make those shifts over the next 10 years, we will start to see we, we won't have to talk about reproductive rights. Right. If we see that people with female biology are in the law, because think about it for a minute. Think about the 14th Amendment as a amendment that says uh, individuals have equal protection of the law, regardless of their reproductive biology. Think about how that shifts everything, right? So whether you are pregnant or not pregnant, you cannot be uh, fired from your job. So your job has to make accommodations for the fact that you're pregnant, as opposed to what we see now, right? I'm sure many of you in your work see pregnancy discrimination rampant, but it's the, the actual amendment protected reproductive biology that a woman who's pregnant would have to have the same accommodation as someone who's not, as men, as trans, as et cetera, right? Then we couldn't discriminate against people who were trans because we would be discriminating against them based on their reproductive biology, whether it was testicles and penis or ovaries and uterus, right? So imagine how that would look different. So that would be the thing I would say where if we can get wins there, more women doing law, more women in spaces where law is discussed and actual women physiology protected by law, you start to see a whole, most of these other things fall into place. Other questions or comments? In terms of number 11, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, what do you see for that? So it, it, we live in a culture that has relegated things that women care about to the realm of the private or the realm of the lewd or the realm of um, immodest or immoral, right? And, and in my lifetime, we have seen a big shift in that, right? We don't talk about illegitimate kids as much as we used to, right? Because that was one of the things that, uh, the realities of women's lives that used to be immoral. If you had a child out of wedlock, right? We don't talk about those things nearly as much, but, I, I think that artists like Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion, they're pushing even my comfort zone in terms of moving things that we used to call private and, and lewd and personal into the public. And why is that powerful? That is powerful because relegating those things to the private also hit a lot of trauma and dysfunction and, um, and predatory behavior, right? Behind those things and ignorance, to be honest. And so as we move those things into the public sphere, yes, it makes us uncomfortable at first, but we have to get, get comfortable with that. It's okay to have things that happen to women be public. And it may not be my cup of tea to go around talking about my WAP, right? And it's Cardi B's cup of tea, but that doesn't make her immoral. That doesn't make her lewd. That doesn't make her loose, right? Because those are the things that we use to label women, to restrict women's, um, freedom and activity and speech, et cetera. And, and a lot of times they sneak under the radar because they've been termed with these uh, neutral terms like private and modest, right? So, so that's what I mean by that. 
I've gotten another question, which is, are there instances that legally regulate vasectomy? I have to pause because I got to think. I can't think of any. Anyone else who's in reproductive health care, chime in if you can think of something. It has to be, the man has to be consenting? I mean, but that's true for any health procedure, right? Anyone? Can anyone think of something? The age uh, thing with vasectomy through our program. Wait, say again. I think you have to be 21 to have a vasectomy. Okay. Yeah. So you have to be whatever the age of consent is that we say. But again, that's true for most surgical procedures that there's some age of consent, right? That you have to be to, to consent to them. Okay. I can't think of anything else. Are there regulations if they've the had children or not? Sorry, I didn't mean to kiss him. No. Are there regulations? No. So they're like, if nope. a woman comes to an OBGYN, usually they're like, oh, they try to, a lot of times are pushed off to like, let's think and explore your options, I'm you know, before you make the decision. That. So. Yes. Because a lot of women get that from, mm -hmm. from uh, uh, providers, OBGYNs, all sorts of providers about, well, you're so young and you may change your mind. And there's, that's not in the law that's in the culture, right? Where we think re women's reproductive biology is up for debate. It's up for, this is just biology. It's her biology to control. But we certainly, and it gets back to that issue of we have to trust women with reproductive rights. No, we don't. No, we don't. It's hers. You, you don't have to trust me with breathing air. I might choose to breathe air that's full of tobacco and carcinogens. And you know what? I have a right to do that, right? We all agree. Those of us in public health, we think smoking is a health hazard. We don't think you should, but people absolutely have a right to do that. Why? It's their biology. If they, that's the air they want to breathe, we let them. That's how I, I want women through reproductive biology to be. This, these are her too. She wants to tie them. Your business. Above the age of consent, we need to make sure you understand the risks and the benefits. The end. And I want to see women's reproductive biology fade into that background. It certainly is where vasectomy is or treating erectile dysfunction or whatever else it is men want to do with their bodies, even though they might do it irresponsibly. I have heard of more than one case of a man getting a vasectomy and not telling his partner. But you know what? There's not a law in the land that will drag him into jail for that. They will say, hmm, sounds like you're having a marital dispute. About it. In the chat, people mentioned age is the only regulation. Yes, yeah, that's the only thing I can think of that you have to be consenting. Yeah, and age is part of that. Yeah. Oh, we wish, right, that our reproductive rights were, were that trouble free and that unregulated. Definitely. Um, and then I also want to highlight number seven, since we asked about 11, and that's very similar, to move away from this rhetoric of reason, because even those of us who are working for reproductive rights, who absolutely feel that women should have a right to the full breadth of reproductive health care, we often use this, uh, or not, not even use, I would say, we often fall for the trap of reason, right? Oh, uh, this was an episode of rape. In, if someone uh, experiences incest, then absolutely they should be able to have an abortion. Let's get out of that rhetoric of reason. You know what? You should be able to have an abortion because you're pregnant and you said so. That's it. That's it. And, and people will often try to um, bully women or bully people who are working for reproductive rights by saying, oh, so you want women to have abortion on demand? Yeah. Yeah, I do. And here's the thing. And here's why I can say that with zero angst, because this is a woman's biology. Her biology should not be held hostage to any political whim. It is her, it's biology. It's not about rights. Similar to, you know, there's so many people who have issues with gay pride. Oh my God, why are they out there shaking like that? Why are they naked? Because they want to, because it's their naked bodies and they have a right to do with them what they will. Right. And I want women's reproductive rights to fade into that background. And I, I am fully confident that in a world where women can have abortions when they want them, we will not be living in a world where 90 percent of babies are aborted. That's a ridiculous notion when you say it that way. Right. But it's, it, it, people use that phrase to bully um, folks who are working for reproductive rights as a, oh, up to you. Ninety percent of pregnancies will be aborted. It's crazy. That, I know that's not going to happen. So, yes, I, we could have abortion be out of this debate altogether, just have it be a health um, 
issue and life will be fine. Babies will be born in love. I agree with that opinion or your your take <laughs> on that aspect. I think I think there's a misconception in the political world that because we make it illegal across the board that like you're saying, like all these women are gonna rush out to these abortion clinics and just yeah. no, like they're still getting them. They just may not be getting them in the responsible manner because of all of these laws and political aspects that you're putting on it, right? So this, right. They, they're, you know, anyways, it's just gonna make it safer so that they're getting the, right. the healthcare that they deserve, you know, right. in, in that and, treatment, so. Absolutely, and I think that, uh, you know, some people who are, are quote unquote, and I really put it in quotes, morally opposed to abortion, have this idea that there's a, a world that exists where there's never an abortion. And I'm, I, again, abortions happen when women don't want them to. And I notice I am not making a distinction between spontaneous, what we call miscarriages, and an abortion that a woman says, yes, I, I'm going to do this. And, and the reason is our biology doesn't make a difference. There are many tens of thousands of women every year who if they could beg, borrow, and steal, they would have their bodies not terminate a pregnancy. But it happens, right? Those, and there's, there's no recourse for them. The very same people who want to legislate abortion, it's not like they write them a check or bring them a baby or give them some, some um, reparations for the fact that this abortion happened against their will, right? It's just a matter, and, and if you said that to them, they would say, oh, but that's just a woman's biology. Why should we give women checks just for their biology? My point indeed, right? <laughs> it's just biology. We shouldn't be legislating it. And, I, and I, I, I make this presentation because I wanna give you all that position to fall back on. This is just biology. Right. When people come at us with arguments about, you know, we need to legislate this, this important the state has a role. One of the things that horrifies me about the Roe v. Wade decision is that, in my mind, that decision established that the state has an interest in pregnancy. What interest does the state have in pregnancy? Really? What, why? What, what interest does the state have in my biology except I am making workers for the economy. And if in fact that is the state's interest in pregnancy, again, where are my reparations for making these people, right? Where, where is the, if I have a complication in pregnancy that endangers my health or life, does the state send me a check? Does the state compensate my family? We have a crisis of maternal mortality in this country. Do those families get taken care of by the state because the state has an interest in pregnancy? Interesting, right? So, and if we go to the state and we make these arguments, the state will say to us, but that's just biology. Exactly, exactly. This is just biology. And we, we need to make the argument that it's just biology. Again, I'm not saying, I'm not Pollyanna. I'm not saying that we can transform these arguments in an instant. But if we keep this in mind, we will start making those changes, making those changes in what we're asking for, making the changes in the policies that we propose, making the changes when we are in the rooms where law and policy and legislation is being decided, we'll start throwing this into the argument, right? We'll start adding this into the debate and, and it will make a difference over time. When we look at that roadmap that we were talking about, I think at one place I saw roadmap to 2030, right? We're looking over the next 10 years, how do we start to shift? How do we start to shift the conversation? We have a few comments in the chat, Dr. Thompson. Um, we do want to wrap up. I know um, Gali said something to say here at the end, but um, we can. Yeah. So, so wanna... if we have if we have one last question we want to take, or if we need to do our wrap up, perfectly fine. This is about hearing from you. We have. Um, we see that in other countries when birth control is fully available and transportation as well, it's openly talking about sex and bodies, there are lower abortion rates. For sure, right? Again, because this isn't about nefarious women who are going out trying to make sure no babies are born, right? This is a matter of female biology. 
So when women have access to the health services that they need, they use them. <laughs> I mean, I, I, that, that seems like such an absurd thing to have to assert to anyone. But true. I agree with your comment. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And there's ample evidence around the world. The other thing that makes a huge difference for women, um, the, the sort of statistics that you see around abortion and contraception is actually investing in women's education investing in women's um, entrepreneurial and, and um, uh, what I want to say, professional opportunities. Because we see that in around the world, that if we just invest in those things, women's education, women's ability to, to go to professional school, women's ability to form businesses, that everything else forms. The children are healthier, there are fewer abortions, there's, there's just, and, and not that I want to make fewer abortions any kind of marker, because like I told you, the number of abortions is meaningless to me. To me, abortion is just a, a women's health care service. And if women need them, they should have access to them. Like, I don't know how many vasectomies are done in Phoenix in a day. And why would I go looking? It's up to that man and his partner, the decision they make for their contraception. Oh, access it. Hope it's available and safe. I don't want anyone coercing you into doing it. These are the things I'm interested in. But whether you have it or not, your choice. That is a choice, but the fact that it exists in the world for you as a health service, not a matter of debate. And, and let's, let's have that as a goal for, for women, that our biology stops being a matter of debate. Thank you all so much for your participation. I yeah. think, um, no, go ahead, Elise, were you gonna No, I was just gonna say, that is a powerful way to wrap up and your presentation was just phenomenal. And I think gave everybody a lot to think about and you know, way really tangible ways that we can start reframing these issues uh, when they come up in our work and in our lives. So, and we're getting a lot of comments in the chat saying thank you for this amazing presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson, and thank you for helping us to end with a bang on our February <laughs> road shows. We hey, appreciate it. thanks all of you for coming on an afternoon. Thanks everyone for being thanks here. Thanks so much. Bye. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. That was great. I really enjoyed it. What's your kitty cat's name? Sky. <laughs> he has blue eyes, so he's Sky. <laughs> and the oh, recording on the whole time. <laughs> he's, he's always in the Zoom. He is always. <laughs> he was pretty quiet this time, so he was good. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. If we want oh, to see welcome. just for a final uh, debrief, guys. Sure. Great job. And that is your background. You should never do a Zoom call without that background. I mean, you have such depth and great color. Yeah, you know, <laughs> this piece that's behind me, it's a weaving. Uh -huh. And a friend, she, oh, went a to, yeah, she went to South Africa and she brought this and she was like, oh, it doesn't really fit in my house. And I, she gave it to me before I bought this house. I had it rolled up in a closet. I painted my house and then I pulled it out and I was like, oh, this is perfect. Oh my gosh, it works so beautifully with the colors. In it's my house. stunning. It's, oh, it's gorgeous. One of my favorite things. It was yeah. awesome. Love it. So I have a quick question. You know, I was going to ask it, but it wrapped up. And of course, my husband called right there at the end, like the recording.